Is it working? I can see you. You are sideways, though. I'm not sure how to help you rotate that. Uh, I'm showing up. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, hang on. Let me. Sorry, I um uh was doing. I got stuck on something else, and then I was having some uh technological issues because I um my internet has been really weird today. I, I think that's happening with everyone. So I was hoping to kind of try and call in with um, the phone instead of the internet. Yeah, you can certainly do that as well. Um, so I don't know if I did that or not, but I'm on my phone rather than, on, how's my hair? Are, it was, so here's a question. Is there going to be a video or is it just audio? Um, I mean, it's a podcast, so. Yeah, so it could be either, I mean, whichever you prefer, but um the uh, the focus really is going to be on the the podcast. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. So um. Yeah. So it's it's really just kind of a dialogue. Um. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll get into it, and then I'll I'll be soft pitching you things. So I'm not gonna I'm not trying to trick you. Gotcha. You're not trying to get me. Trying to get you. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll just get into it. I'll start with the intro and, uh -huh. uh, and, we'll, and we'll go for it. Okay. Sounds good. This is Andre Cohen for another episode of Speaking of Diversity and Inclusion here at Mayo Clinic. Um, right now we're in a time of lots of chaos and ambiguity people are uh, are clamoring for answers when in some cases there aren't answers uh, we do know that uh, data statistics historical context and science can give us some answers but they don't necessarily have the answers and so how do we make sense of a world that's in chaos how do we make sense out of the uncertainty that are in our uh, at our doorstep and I think a, a large part of that is that we take control of those things and um, so I have uh, Keely Heron here who's going to talk with us a little bit about how she escaped from the now you, what was your TED talk the title of your TED talk was escaping from it was the cult of happiness. Cult of happiness. That's right. Yeah. So it's leaving, leaving the cult of happiness. The cult of happiness. And, um, and, and so uh, I've asked her to kind of have a conversation with us because how do we actually deal with situations that aren't good situations to be in, right? How do we maximize our own potential in, situ in, in, in contexts that aren't really all that great, right? So, um, so, so Keely, tell us a little bit about you and, and, and some of the work that you've done. Well, I, um, I'm originally from Minnesota and I grew up here and I went to the University of Minnesota. Um, and my career has largely been in advertising and marketing. So I've spent um, a lot of time thinking about human behavior and why people make the decisions that they do. Um, and also concurrently, not as a professional, I have been involved in mental health advocacy, and that was driven by um, my father's suicide in 1999. Um, and after that, I became involved in um, working with an organization called SAVE, which is Suicide Awareness Voices of Education. Um, and I am currently on the Speakers Bureau for NAMI Minnesota, and I do... Um, uh, talks about my own experience with obviously suicide and mental illness, as well as my own experience with sexual trauma and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. All right. So it's interesting that you brought NAMI up because uh, we've done some podcasts for NAMI. So that's, uh, um, and also some training for, for, for NAMI. Um, so so the, Let's get into some of the parts that are more intriguing for me, right? So, so first of all, what was it like to do a TED Talk? So let, let's start there, and then we'll come back to the more weighty stuff. But I, I'm just curious, what was that like for you to, to, to stand up and do a TED Talk? Well, I should clarify that it was a TEDx Talk. So it wasn't TED Mothership. I just have to 
clarify that because um, they are different entities. TEDx uh, Jackson Hole was the um, organization that I spoke for. And um, so I, I, I was living in Jackson and I was invited to do a talk. Um, I had been participating in, um, they call, they're called story slams. I don't know if you've heard of the Moth Radio Hour, but we had a local version in Jackson. Um, and I had been doing those. And um, at one of them, a friend of mine who was on the TEDx committee, um, she was in the audience and she said, you know, we should talk. Um, Jackson Hole was in the path of totality for the total solar eclipse um, in 2017. And the, and the theme was out of darkness. Um, and so that was very... Um, coincidental for me because I had participated in walks for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And the name of those walks is the Out of Darkness Walks. So, you know, as we talked um, about, you know, me participating uh, in the TEDx event in 2017, it became really obvious that the suicide part of my story, which is my father's story, um, and then my experience with that, um, that would be an obvious thing that I would speak about. But as the, co as the coaches helped me develop the talk, it became clear that the story of my experience with sexual trauma um, was, was a pretty significant part of that story as well. And um, I've always joked that um, when I die, you'll have to pull the microphone from my cold, dead hands. Um, I've never been afraid of public speaking. Um, and there's something about, um, you know, connecting with the audience and having an opportunity to share something that is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little daunting, I'm not going to lie, to get up on a stage in front of 500 people and talk about my deepest, darkest secrets um, that I had never really discussed publicly prior to that. Um, so it took a lot of effort to get to the point where there was a point where I had a, a call to action. Because um, I didn't want to just stand up on a stage and say, all of these horrible things happened to me, poor me, you should feel sorry for me. I wanted to get to a point in the talk where my experience illuminated a larger truth about the human experience and allowed me to share what I had learned from these challenges that I didn't ask for, didn't like, didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, but nonetheless had to manage. And, you know, there's pretty significant ongoing fallout from those types of experiences. Um, you know, and the past isn't always in the past um, when you're talking about trauma. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a very thoughtful process of saying, okay, what is the point here? So... so Explain to me. So, so one of the things that intrigued me was, was the was Frank Quink, Frank Quink, I mean, uh, <laughs> frankly, the, the 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 title, the cult of happiness. So, so can you tell us a, a little bit about this, this this cult of happiness, or or what what, what is that? <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> um, you know, working in what's that? <laughs> I said, uh, good marketing. Yeah, exactly. Working in advertising and marketing, um, you know, I that's part of what you do is you you find something that's um, catchy or sticky or makes you know is kind of interruptive that that sort of makes you go, what is that? Um, and it's interesting because since then, so I gave the talk in August of 2017, and since then I've learned about a term that's, you know, become pretty popular called toxic positivity. And I think that that is an interesting term that's very, very similar to the idea that I was trying to get across with the cult of happiness, which is that, you know, in American culture, certainly, you know, in, in, in Western culture, you know, 
broadly, but definitely in American culture, there is this idea that we can only be happy, that we can only be positive, that we, um, that it's not polite, it's not acceptable to discuss things that are negative. You know, we don't want to be a Debbie Downer. We don't want to trouble other people. We don't want to be a burden. And so there's this toxic element of positivity where even if we're really suffering, we put on a brave face. And, you know, when somebody says, how are you? We know that they're not really asking how we are. We just say, oh, we're good. We're busy. And, and they really, we also get the message that they really don't want to be, know how we are because then they have to do something with, with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this, this toxic positivity, I think this is a really interesting thing because one of the things that we're supposed to pretend is that although we're dealing with this, this virus that there's so many things we don't know, uh, there are things that we've been told and there's mis misinformation and disinformation and all these things are kind of in the same biosphere, but we're supposed to pretend like this is normal. Like kids are, are, are not in school. They're not doing proms. They're not graduating, but we're supposed to do their online learning as if this is a normal situation. Mm -hmm. Did, and I think, I think, what are the problems? What are the challenges that come with that level of so-called positivity? Well, I think what, what I've learned through dealing with the issues that I've had to deal with is that the first step to really being able to effectively manage something that's unpleasant, <laughs> unpleasant at best, and sometimes, you know, incredibly harmful or malignant or dangerous. Um, the first step to being able to effectively manage something is the ability to see it, to name it, to accept it, and to begin to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when we talk about the cult of happiness or toxic positivity, um, we skip over the naming accepting understanding part and try to get to the part where like everything's fine mm -hmm. you know another term that i've heard about um a similar idea is spiritual bypassing <laughs> mm. which is really popular in the sort of new age um you know i call it the hashtag blessed culture mm -hmm. where we are you know maybe in the basement of our spiritual development, or maybe we are in the basement of our mood or happiness or ability to deal with something. Um, you know, we're not dealing with something effectively. We're not managing something effectively. Maybe we're very depressed. Maybe we're dealing with a clinical diagnosis that's incredibly challenging. Um, you know, you can't just push the elevator button and get on the elevator and go from clinically depressed all the way to everything's great you know you got to go to the you know maybe you go up one level and maybe you stay there for a while you know you have to do the work and so that was one of the main messages of my tedx talk is the only way out is through you mm -hmm. know you can't just skip over all of the difficult parts and get to the part where everything's fine because we can keep that up for a while. We can keep up that everything's okay for a while, but eventually it's going to crack. But that facade will crack because it's not built on anything real. It's a facade. Yeah. That, I, I think it's so interesting because I, I, I've been feeling this with, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a social animal. I'm a, I'm a people person. So the fact that I can't, you know, be in front of audiences or, or helping groups of people, you know, achieve a goal or tackle a challenge in a group setting. Like this, this is a lot for me to be in this kind of isolated kind of position. And what I figured out is that I, I'm actually in mourning. Yeah. I, 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 there is either a part or a sensibility or, or, you know, this, this innocence of, 
all those things that is actually dying and i'm 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 mourning the <laughs> right um, yeah and, and 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 i think sometimes when these changes happen we don't give ourselves the space to yeah because I'm thinking about some of the things you're talking about, and I go go back to that that cycle of, you know, um, to that morning cycle. Like, wow, no, this is, I, I actually have lost something, and it's real. Yeah. And I have to recognize that, you know, mm-hmm. grief cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, that brings up a very good point about you know the cycle of grief is not linear, you know? (laughs) We ping all around inside grief, you know? And one day it's great. And the next day it's, you know, you're in the pit of despair. And the next day you're somewhere in between. And I mean, we, we, it's not linear. It's not a cycle. It's not like we begin here and then we move on to the next stage and it's, and then the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. It's like, you know, especially um, in my experience with trauma, um, where again, when I gave my talk in 2017, I didn't even, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is not even a diagnosis in the DSM at the moment. It's it's recognized by the World Health Organization, but it has not yet been recognized um, in the diagnostic statistical manual in the U.S., which means that it is not officially a diagnosis. You cannot be treated for complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And they can't bill for it. Correct. Yeah. (laughs) That's another. Yeah. So, um, you know, so as we talk about trauma, you know, and and it's very popular to talk about triggers, you know, and and, um, I think one of the, the negative things that gets thrown around is like, oh, okay, snowflake, you're triggered. Um, which I think is, you know, I, I get where that comes from, like that people feel unsafe to express their opinions because someone's going to get triggered. Um, but you know, triggers are a real thing. And if you have a trauma background and you get triggered, you're right back in it. So as that pertains to grief, you know, when you're grieving something, you could make tons of progress on, on dealing with that grief or that trauma or that pain or that suffering. And then you could get triggered 16 years later and you could go right back into that fight or flight feeling and not have the skills or the tools to deal with it. Um, And I think my message, my main message that I always come back to is about compassionate, non-judgmental listening or compassionate, non-judgmental witnessing Mm -hmm. of others suffering because we all suffer. We all have our own burdens that we have to carry. And I think it's very important to allow oneself to recognize the burdens that we're carrying and, you know, to see them to accept them and to begin to understand them so that we can begin to process them so that we are able to, that we have the capacity to, that we have the tools to help others. It's the whole concept of putting the mask over your nose and mouth before you help others. Um, And I think, you know, what you're talking about with your experience with I'm a social person and I'm suddenly in this place of not having that stimulus that, you know, you're not able to fill your cup, so to speak, Mm -hmm. you know, to just even have the self-awareness to acknowledge that that is a loss um, allows you to fill your cup in other ways so that if somebody's like having a hard time and wants to talk about their own feelings that you're not like, well, this is hard for me too. You, you know, but because if it's hard for you, first of all, you need to say, yeah, this is hard for me and this is how I'm dealing with it. So that when someone says, this is really hard, you don't have that. I'm going to shut you down and I'm going to shame you for having this reaction because I'm suffering too and I'm dealing with this. So so that brings me to something that I think is very interesting, which is, you know, uh, people will talk about resilience, 
right? Mm -hmm. Say, you know, you just need to, you know, the, the situation is, is bad, so let's just build up our resilience. <laughs> there are time when we just say, no, I'm not going to build up a tolerance to this particular state of being. Like, I, I just, I, I, I don't want to build a tolerance to a dysfunctional whatever, right? Did, 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 do we ever get to that point? Or, 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 or how do we get to that point? Would you, would you how would you answer that? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, I need to make sure that it's very clear that I am not a doctor. I am not a psychologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't have any training in those things. My, my insights come primarily from my own experience and the research that I've done to help myself. Um, and my desire to help other people based on what I've learned. Um, and I would say what has helped me a lot is mindfulness training. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of that for me personally um, comes out of um, my Buddhist beliefs, my beliefs in Buddhism, which is a non-theistic um, uh, religion, quote unquote, it, there is no God in Buddhism. It's, it's really a practice. And it's about um, allowing things to be as they are uh, without clinging or without aversion. So as we talk about things to which we shouldn't build up resilience, um, things are whether or not we like them. They exist. And so my approach to dealing with things that I don't like and that I can't control is first to attempt to alleviate suffering. Mm. And for me personally, that comes down to seeing it, acknowledging it, accepting it, understanding it, and developing a a tool to manage my own reaction to that thing. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I get really fired up about income inequality. That really is one of my triggers. Um, income inequality exists. It probably will always exist. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think we should say, oh, that's okay. Income inequality exists. It's always going to exist. I think we can try to change it. But in terms of my own suffering around it and my own, you know, how it gets me all riled up and freaked out, um, I, I try to alleviate my own suffering around that particular issue by not getting riled up. Mm -hmm. Having a measured, conscious, rational approach while still acknowledging that my emotional response to that is real. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that leads me to another tool that I have personally found really, really helpful, which is DBT, which stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And a dialectic is basically the understanding that two things that appear to be completely opposite are both true at the same time. Um, and, and dialectical behavior therapy has been a godsend for me. It's been life-changing. And the, the basis of that is mindfulness, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it really does come down to a pretty simple premise, which is just to be mindful about what's going on and to, and to take a moment to pause, to consider your response as opposed to just having a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. To things. Yeah. So, so w what I recognize is that many of our listening audience participants um, are some of them are facing furloughs. Are uh, mm. some of them are facing um, working in pretty uh, intense environments. Um, and so, you know, something that you said that that really struck me was you know, um, one of the processes that I use for my own growth and development is uh, cognitive behavior therapy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, being thoughtful of my, my feelings 
uh, how they influence my behavior and controlling my thoughts, right? So really mm -hmm. trying to those things towards my goal. And so um, as, we, as we kind of think about the, 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 this, the, the loss that, that people are having, right? So the folks who were thinking mm -hmm. about going on vacation, they're probably not thinking about that anymore. And so that, mm -hmm. that it's actually okay to recognize those things and say that that, that, that that loss is okay, simultaneously saying that there are also opportunities. And, and I think um, the, 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 the cult of happiness or even this toxic positivity only looks at one aspect and not taking both into account as a balanced relationship. Um, so I, I like that dialectical um, process that you that you presented because I hope that our listeners are able to recognize that both can be true. I can have tremendous loss and tremendous opportunity in the same situation at the same time. Um, so is there any other, so as we, we kind of wrap up this this part of our conversation is there anything else that you would encourage people to do that are experiencing this trauma that may be having this loss that um that you know the the, the current you know kind of nebulous ambiguous chaotic environment that we're in and anything that you would encourage them to to do or think about as they try to make sense uh, of this life for themselves Mm -hmm. Well, I think the thing that I always try to remind myself is that pain is like a gas and it expands to fill the space that we have for it. So comparing my trauma to someone else's trauma um, is never helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I say that especially, I don't know if you've heard about the term the pain Olympics. So where I'm saying like, I shouldn't be upset because I have a place to live. I've got, you know, resources. I have all these things that are great in my life. I shouldn't feel sad because there are millions of people who don't have it as good as me. So I should just suck it up and get on with my life and quit whining. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on some level, maybe that's true. But is it helpful to you in dealing with your whatever you're dealing with that you're, that you're struggling to deal with. And so I think to remember that compassion begins at home. The, this idea of putting the mask over your nose and mouth before you attempt to help others. Like it's just so basic. If you are not capable of helping yourself, you are not capable of helping others. Mm. And so you know, if, if someone is drowning, you don't jump out of the boat and drown with them. You know, you, you, you always have to help yourself first. Mm -hmm. And that is not selfish. That is in fact responsible. That is taking accountability for yourself. And if you're struggling, you know, your job is to ask for help. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if we begin to shift from the cult of happiness where we, you know, are armored and it's all about me and I have to achieve this thing and I have to show the world that I'm whatever idea it is that I think I need to show the world. If we shift from that cult of happiness more to a cult of compassion mm -hmm. where it's more collective and it's more we instead of I the root of the word compassion is to suffer together. The Latin root is to suffer together. And I think it's a really basic concept that my suffering is not only mine. If I am capable of becoming more uh, compassionate to myself, becoming more resourced, becoming more resilient to myself, then I am more capable of helping others. Um, and so the first thing is to be compassionate to yourself and to not have negative self-talk and tell yourself that you're weak or bad for feeling bad. Yeah. So 
that doesn't do any good. It doesn't get you anywhere except for feeling more badly, <laughs> which is the opposite of helping others. Yeah. So it's so interesting that you bring that forward because uh, our, 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 our mission statement, our vision statement really circles around the needs of the patient come first. And that, that's the primary way in which we do all of our operations. And what I also hear you saying is that the needs of the helpers who are helping the needs of the patient come first should also be a consideration, right? That, 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 Absolutely. Um, that also should be helpful. So um, I, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to talk with us here at Speaking Of. And, um, and so for, for more information uh, about Keely and, and, all the, uh, and all the things she does, we'll, we'll put those in the, in the show notes so you can get uh, in contact with her. Um, and NAMI, um, can you just give me a, a short commercial about NAMI? So for folks who may not necessarily be familiar, both with the acronym as well as the organization itself. Mm -hmm. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and it is the nation's largest uh, grassroots mental health organization, and it provides advocacy, education, support, and public awareness um, so that all people affected by mental illness can build better lives. And NAMI Minnesota is the state chapter of NAMI, and um, NAMI Minnesota also provides advocacy, access to groups, classes, and other resources um, for those who actively live with a mental illness, and it also has resources for friends and family members supporting a loved one living with a mental illness. And I can't say enough good things about um, NAMI Minnesota and the leadership there. They've been a tremendous asset to people, um, you know, living with mental illness in the state of Minnesota. And um, they do a lot of work with the legislature to advocate for people living with mental illness. So I'm very proud to be uh, an advocate on their Speakers Bureau. And we're very humbled that you would speak with us today. Uh, we, we look forward to possible further conversations. Um, but uh, for, for this time, um, we, we're going to end this here. Uh, my name is Andre Cohen. I want to say thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Speaking of Diversity and Inclusion here at Mayo Clinic. And more than anything, take care of yourself. We're out of here. Thanks.